Good evening. I'm Professor Ian Hickey from the Brain and Mind Centre at the University of Sydney, where I'm the co-director of Health and Policy. This is a really special webinar for us this evening. Over the last few days and over the last week, you may be aware, you may have seen in the national press and in our national media, some considerable emphasis on projections and predictions that we've made about the potential adverse effects of COVID-19 on our wider society and the specific downstream effects on mental ill health and potentially most importantly on suicide rates in this country. Many, many people have asked us, what's the basis for that stuff? There's also been a fair amount of constructive criticism wanting to know just exactly where did this come from? Did you make it up last week? Is it some academic research trial? Has it been subject to review? Does it really deal with lived experience? Is it relevant to place? Has it actually been worked in ways that will actually be useful to those who have to make decisions in real time now? I must say the great thing is we have seen an immediate response from our health minister, from Greg Hunt, and from our federal government. And these issues will be discussed by the National Cabinet of Australia on Friday. That's great. And I must commend the government on actually taking these things seriously. Australia is the first country to really put mental health on the agenda in the COVID-19 crisis and to now have, as of today, a Deputy Chief Medical Officer. And I must congratulate Dr. Ruth Vine on her appointment. She's an excellent appointment, a skilled clinician and administrator to that post, to take sensible medical and expert advice to government to actually make decisions to potentially flatten the curve. So this webinar is, what is this curve? What is it all about? But most importantly, not simply to be alarmist at the size of the curve, but actually to look at the options that are available to us, economically, socially, educationally, to flatten that curve. That's the goal. Just like we saw in Australia, we saw governments take immediate actions to protect us from the disastrous health outcomes, which have so characterized North America, Europe, and other parts of the world. Given the size of the economic and social dislocation, this is huge. The potentials for us in mental ill health are large. In my 30 years in this mental health area and population health related to mental health and its outcomes, this is by far the biggest challenge. When, it, when unemployment rates go from 5% to 10% in two months, and when those requiring direct income supports for unemployment go from 600,000 to 1.5 million in the same period of time, and with great uncertainty in the world, and in our own backyards as to what happens next. This is by far the biggest challenge. We recognise that mental health for all of us, our own mental health and wellbeing, and that mental wealth of Australia is fundamentally locked in the economic, social welfare of our communities and plays out in terms of ourselves individually. In taking the particular webinar forward tonight, I would like to recognise the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, and particularly the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, on which the Camperdown campus of the Brain and Mind Centre is based. It is one of those occasions in which we could all learn from the first Australians in this country. Can we actually come together as a community and understand the social and emotional well-being of all of us to achieve the best possible outcomes? Right at the start, I'd like to show you a video put together by Julie Sturgis, the CEO of the North Coast PHN and her colleagues there from all the organisations that are coming together to form the North Coast Collective. I've had it said to me this week, it must have been a bunch of nerdy people in back rooms who just make up mathematical models and the statistical pool and there's no real people and there's no real place. They've just done this stuff on the back of an envelope somewhere to scare us all. It isn't really about real people, real places, the real regions in Australia. Just to deal with that right off the bat and say it's about models that people can use in the future. Courtesy of Julie and her colleagues, I would like to start by showing you the video of the process that has led to these models. If we could start that video now. North Coast Collective was established because we were looking at the way we currently commission services and we realised that if we joined together collectively to invest our money, we could deliver much better outcomes for the North Coast community. 
complex and dynamic system modelling brings essentially mathematics into something to project and predict things that we just don't have the bandwidth in our own minds to deliver. So it gives us a much clearer and more accurate picture of what we can expect out of the services we're commissioning in the future by taking a really evidence-based but pragmatic modelling approach to it. We haven't had access to these tools previously. When you take those tools and you put them in combination with local community leadership, you really have the potential to map, to plan what really needs to happen, where the gaps are, where the connections need to be, what needs to make a real difference, and then make smart investments, track the outcomes and see whether you get what you want to. We really see the value of these tools as being a long-term decision support asset that can be embedded in ongoing monitoring and evaluation systems so that as new data comes in and new evidence becomes available, these tools can be updated and they become more robust over time and can really help form part of the ongoing decision support infrastructure for the region. The systems dynamics model and then the optimization that follows that is a point in time, but really they're part, of, they're part of a pathway that's looking at changing from input focused and looking at input equity to health outcome equity in a way that can be measured over time. It's really part of a transition and a much longer term transition towards better health outcomes. And in fact, it's starting off with mental health, but the intention is to move to other areas of health as well. Governing bodies only have a finite resource that they can invest in terms of health and well-being for the community. And it's about trying to use these models to understand, well, how can I best spend that money to get the best outcomes for people? So our intention when we build these models is to produce something that can be used by decision makers. So we're aiming to give them a tool that they can use to make decisions in an evidence-informed way. The types of interventions that can be included in a model like this vary from upstream interventions or upstream investments in reducing the social disparities, but also around uh, what investments can be made to strengthen the service system, and importantly, how investments across those two areas can work together to deliver greatest longer-term impact. Maybe for the first time we can model the impact of interventions long-term. Using algorithms and statistics, so you know, there's a red invest in acute care, primary care, social determinants, and looking at the impact long-term will help us make the better investment decisions. The opportunities this is giving for our clinicians and managers to look at the opportunity to change and invest in areas where we're going to get greater return, and that return isn't money, it's about the quality of life for these people suffering from mental illness and AOD services, is outstanding. I think it's really important that North Coast PHN is sitting behind the North Coast Collective and then working with local health district partners, non-government partners, everybody else to make a real difference. That's what PHN should do. It's mechanisms like the Collective that really go to what is the big impact and how do we get there. We've incorporated all of the latest data and all of the latest evidence around interventions and the things that we know, but you know, critically important is we've used a participatory design process. So we've had the community involved in building our model. We're not just having a theoretical approach, but we're testing that approach against what really happens on the ground. So we feel like we're really close to reflecting, you know, what's really out there for people. So I must say I'm incredibly grateful to Julie Sturgis and her team for investing over time. That kind of participatory design does not happen overnight. We're very fortunate now in the COVID-19 crisis that we had all this prior work done. It's real, it's worked out, it's local. It can then use what happens now when a really a huge challenge comes along to actually deal with these issues. And we've been able to obviously use new data. Now, when it goes to what it actually goes into the models, it's pretty clear to anyone who knows me that I'm obviously not the brains behind the outfit and can't put those things together. So I'm gonna hand over now to Professor Joanne Atkinson, who leads the statistical modeling team here at the Brain and Mind Centre to explain actually mathematically just how complicated it is and how it gets done. Joanne. Thanks, Ian. So over the past few months, the role and value of systems modelling in informing the national response to the threat of COVID-19 has been thrust into the limelight and into 
the consciousness of researchers and decision makers and the general public to an extent that's never been achieved before. Researchers from multiple disciplines have been working together to rapidly deploy systems models based on existing but imperfect data and expert knowledge. And there's been unprecedented levels of cross-jurisdictional cooperation in facilitating the exchange of data and critical information needed to improve these models and improve our capability for rapid and effective responses to the crisis. So um, what we're presenting tonight is really a, a similar approach, but, uh, but for mental health. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, while the different trajectories of the COVID-19 epidemic curve had been, have been etched into the minds of a whole generation, um, a new curve is keeping many of us awake at night. A mental health related curve whose height and duration, as, as Ian mentioned, will depend on the length and impact of the recession, of unemployment rates, particularly in young people, and social dislocation. And it will also depend on how effectively we can respond. Next slide, please. So we've been working with, uh, for a number of years with regional planners um, and, and their stakeholders applying systems modelling and simulation to provide robust decision support tools to inform mental health services planning and suicide prevention. And so to provide some pre preliminary insights into what it would take to flatten the curve, we rapidly deployed the, the detailed model we developed last year last year with, with Julie and North Coast uh, Primary Health Network uh, and, uh, and the North Coast Collective. And you'll hear more about that work later in the session as well. Next slide, please. So the model architect is actually one of our most talented mathematical modelers at the Brain and Mind Centre, Dr. Adam Skinner, who combined the local knowledge of, of the regional systems and challenges with published research evidence and best available uh, regional, state and national data sets to develop the model. And while there isn't time to go into a huge amount of detail uh, of the model this evening, this figure uh, really represents a high level overview of the structure and pathways of the system dynamics model, um, which captures the dynamics of the North Coast population, uh, of psychological distress, the dynamics of mental health services in the region, the social determinants of mental health and their impact on suicide behaviour. Uh, next slide, please. So the model has been validated by ensuring that it can reproduce historic data across a range of indicators, including prevalence of psychological distress, uh, mental health related uh, ED presentations, hospitalizations, community based uh, uh, service utilization and, uh, and suicidal behavior. Next slide, please. And through the interface, we can test different scenarios to figure out at a strategic level how best to flatten the curve. Under the pre-COVID baseline scenario, which you, you see, which is the blue line there, suicide deaths were forecast uh, even before COVID to, uh, to rise before plateauing in 2021-22, with an estimated 490 deaths projected for the region over the next five years. Next slide, please. So when we, um, we then ran a scenario where we increased unemployment rate uh, for the region to 11% and youth unemployment to 24%. And um, we also simulated a 10% reduction in social connectedness to try and um, uh, reflect what we uh, may see in the real world over, over the coming 12 months. And under this scenario, total suicide deaths were forecast to increase by 23% over the next five years. Um, and that's an additional uh, 113 suicide deaths in the region. Next slide, please. We then explored some mitigation strategies. So firstly, we simulated a 20% increase in the current growth rate of services capacity um, of, uh, and what I mean by that is uh, mental health GPs, psychiatrists and allied services and community mental health uh, healthcare services. And uh, this was forecast to reduce suicides by less than half a percent over the next five years, telling us that a little bit is not going to be enough. Next slide, please. We uh, then simulated a 50% increase in the uh, current growth rate of services capacity. And this was forecast to reduce suicides by 1.1% over the next five years. Still no substantial flattening of the curve within the next five years, but impacts do amplify over the longer, longer term horizon. Next slide, please. 
it's not until we doubled the current growth rate of services capacity did we really start to flatten the curve and bring it down to the pre-COVID baseline levels in the region. But this takes too long. It takes until 2031. So while services capacity growth is going to be important, we need to explore what else we can do in combination. Next slide, please. So we simulated the implementation of better care coordination through the harnessing of technology. Uh, in addition to increasing services capacity. And this combination is forecast to reduce suicide deaths by almost 5%, a more than doubling of the impact of increases to services capacity alone. And Frank will speak more about this in his presentation. Next slide, please. So then we simulated the addition of post-suicide attempt assertive aftercare, which uh, is active outreach and enhanced contact to support someone after a suicide attempt on top of increases in service capacity and technology enabled care coordination. And this combination was forecast to deliver an 8.8% reduction in suicidal behavior, averting 600, around 670 suicide attempts and 53 deaths in the region, and really starts to flatten the curve. Uh, and next, next slide, please. Um, in addition to impacts on suicide, doubling services capacity uh, also reduces pressure on the health system by averting almost 2,000 mental health related ED presentations. Uh, next slide, please. And with technology enabled care coordination, the curve flattens even further, averting about 4,200 ED presentations over the next five years in the North Coast region. Uh, next slide, please. And post-suicide attempt assertive aftercare, while having a good impact on suicide outcomes, doesn't contribute much to reducing mental health-related ED presentations at the population level. Next slide, please. So proactive strategic investments in mental health programs and services will play a vital role in supplementing current efforts to provide social and economic supports and also to uh, uh, increase community connectedness. And while uh, not shown here, our simulations of the impact of improving community connectedness across all of our models so far points to its importance and will make a significant contribution beyond health services to help flatten the curve. Next slide, please. So in wrapping up, it's important to qualify that our systems modelling um, across a number of areas suggests that there are regional differences that can really influence the degree to which even evidence-based interventions are likely to deliver real impacts in any given region. So systems modelling with participatory processes to ensure that all voices and perspectives contribute to, uh, can contribute to their development should be an essential part of the regional decision support infrastructure to inform the allocation of mental health spending in a way that's strategic, um, efficient and delivers the quality of care needed to make a real difference. This is a critical juncture for mental health and suicide prevention. Will we just go back to the same ways we've always done things, continuing to try and plug holes in a mental health system that falls short for many? Or will we harness the same disciplined, complex systems modeling approach that has underpinned the successful response to the coronavirus threat in Australia to take us on a new mental health trajectory in this country? Thank you. Joe, that's incredibly helpful. And that is a whirlwind tour of a year of incredibly complex work. I understand Adam hasn't slept for a week and a year, actually putting together the figures for the nation over the last week and for the year before that in putting together this incredibly complex model. Now, a number of people have noted during the Q&A and you can type on the Q&A and I'm responding to as many of those as I can in real time for those who can see me typing furiously. We will provide the slides for the whole webinar for people to look into detail. You can see the complexity in the number of those slides of each of them, the boxes around the economy, around the healthcare system, around the social systems themselves are elaborate subsystems of the model with elaborate parameter estimates and great deal of detail of explanation and transparency. There is transparency. What is in there, why it's there, the size of the effect can be interrogated. It can actually be improved or changed. And there've been a number of questions that I have to go back and look at myself here. Some related to peer work, some related to other interventions, as to how they've been modeled, how they might operate, how they've been mapped in these particular communities. In different communities, you'll have different inputs. There are different demographies. Some people have asked about Aboriginal persons, for example, better addressed perhaps in our Western New South Wales model to some degree, but extremely relevant here in the North Coast as well. So you can go into subpopulations. We've had a particular preoccupation with youth populations, with disadvantaged populations. 
So when the models are elaborate, well worked out and taken to these regional areas, you can look in your region. Are the right people or the most disadvantaged people or those most at risk actually being connected? As we've said to government just repeatedly this week, I want to know whether JobKeeper and JobSeeker actually get to the most disadvantaged people or not. Casual workers, young people, those who are outside the system, are they effective as planned? Some things apparently planned in Canberra don't always reach Lismore or Byron Bay or Grafton in the way that was exactly planned. But to take us further down that road, we need to hand over to Julie Sturgis, who has really led this campaign on the North Coast to get our act together in the regions of Australia. The Federation, some people think it's a problem, a 19th century construction to get us all together. Julie, can it work? Can you explain why you did this? And now when you face the challenge of COVID-19, how valuable is this tool to you? Thanks, Ian. Look, I, look, I think, I mean, you've covered it and Joe's covered. I mean, it's incredible. Every day, I think, on the North Coast, we find new ways to apply the learnings that we have from um, the model. But I suppose, um, you know, I'm happy. I guess what I really want to cover is why we did it in the first place, which is something that you just mentioned. Can we just go to that next slide? Um, I think it started, and as you said, we've been on this journey for about 12 months um, around the modelling, but before that, quite a bit of work on the North Coast around how we were dealing um, with mental health and alcohol and other drug um, issues in our catchment. And certainly the first part of that journey was identifying um, the burden that we actually had on the North Coast, um, and particularly from a PHM perspective, understanding, um, you know, with all the funding that we had, how did we actually meet the requirements or meet the need um, in the catchment that we had. When we actually looked at all of the services we commissioned, um, and there are lots, um, and all of the people that actually access them, we realised that um, really we probably, if we were being optimistic, maybe saw between five and 10% of the people that actually had any need. And I think that drove a lot of the work we were doing because what we realised we needed to do is better understand the system if we were going to ever um, have a hope of increasing um, our delivery and meeting the needs of that population. And I think it wasn't just the PHN, but particularly as you allude to, and you'll see from that other diagram, is that there were lots of other services out there that were also doing the same thing that we were, or certainly contributing services um, to address mental health and alcohol and other drug issues. So um, in looking at that, we embarked first on a process around just understanding the programs that we commissioned. Um, and you know, what I will say is that we have a lot of great service providers and a lot of great programs out there. If we can just go to the next slide. Um, but, and, and everything that we commission is evidence-based. Um, but I think the critical thing we did is actually look at, there is an evidence beha base behind a lot of those models, but actually in our area, in our region, how was that evidence base playing out and what were the outcomes that we were seeing across those populations? <laughs> um, and, you know, what we saw is that by commissioning services differently and really understanding those outcomes, both short and long term, we could probably commission in a much smarter way to get better outcomes for the region. Now, that was just looking at PHN money, but what we realised is all of those silos and that complex system, we needed to work much harder to understand what that was. And so, you know, obviously the modelling um, became really important to us in that journey because, you know, it clearly articulates the importance of all the other service providers and all the other interventions that go into a system to make it come together and deliver outcomes. So uh, it's just been a critical piece of work in, I guess, illuminating, um, you know, those journeys for people um, and how we get there. And it's been critical, not just for the clinicians involved in that, um, but for the community too. And, and as you saw in that video, we've had, um, all of the community, people with lived experience, their carers, and this isn't just been a health exercise. We've had police and education, refugee health, um, all of those, uh, you know, obviously the local health districts have been key partners in this, in helping us to develop something that's comprehensive and looks at things from many different angles. Sorry, um, next slide, please. 
So really, I guess where we're going on the North Coast now is, you know, understanding the burden, but then particularly linking the inputs or the services we commission to the outcomes that we're getting. And we're using the modelling to do that. Um, determining the key interventions that we're going to invest in. And, you know, Joe identified some of those key ones and certainly, you know, um, technology enabled coordinated care and social connectedness and those things are very high on our priority list. And we also take it a step far further and you look, look at how we apply that on the ground because obviously we need to take individual populations. And again, we're, we're commissioning for equitable outcomes, not just um, equitable inputs. So we're really looking at how we apply that. Um, and, then, and then forecasting what the change that we expect to see at a population level will be. I think really important, and I haven't put the, the dynamic modelling beside that last point, but you know, the important thing that we're doing is projecting the outcomes that we think we will achieve. And with commissioning all of the services now, we have a trajectory that we expect to see. And so in an ongoing monitoring and management perspective, the model lets us track performance of all of those interventions. And if they're not delivering um, the outcomes that we expect to see, then, you know, either, first of all, we look at how we're implementing them, or secondly, they may be the wrong interventions to achieve what we thought. So I think that is um, critically important. Um, next slide, please. So um, I think, you know, one of the most important things that we've seen, the colours in this have changed a bit, so I'm looking at it going, I, I've got to read it. But um, is that what we know is there is a finite budget that we need to work within. And what we often do is look at um, the outcomes of the um, funds that we do spend and go, are, are, we are we delivering the outcomes? But the other thing the model lets us do is look at the outcomes from the things we choose not to invest in. And so understanding the risk in our population around services we choose not to spend money on either. So at a portfolio level, we feel like um, as, as health service commissioners and providers that we have a good understanding of all the risk that is happening in our area. Now to do it, um, next slide please. Um, really what we've done on the North Coast is um, initially established what we call the North Coast Collective. And the initial partners in the collective have been the primary health network and the local health districts. And, you know, it's just because we um, had a, a big focus on health interventions in that. But in a vision where, you know, we put carers and consumers at the centre of what we do, um, and particularly through the modelling, understanding the importance of the social determinants, then a big focus of the collective moving forward is how we engage other service partners um, and, other, you know, those other silos that contribute to outcomes in the collective approach. So that, you know, is a critical part about, you know, not looking at only health investment, but looking at the investment that contributes to those outcomes across the board at a regional level. Um, next slide, please. And so we have a really ambitious um, target around how we move to a regional model for commissioning. And certainly we're not there yet. But, you know, what we hope we're starting to do is move from, you know, segmented funders and um, commissioners and then providers who are all working towards, you know, very siloed and perhaps different outcomes to at least having a shared approach um, to our commissioning strategy and a shared approach that both the community and service providers understand what outcomes we are trying to achieve and agree on those. And, you know, when we focus on those outcomes, there will be some things that, that we prioritise as different outcomes in our region to what other regions might do. And, you know, the hope is that sometime in the future, we move to a much stronger regional um, governance model around commissioning so that we have um, a seamless approach to um, addressing mental health and AOD issues across the continuum. And I suppose I should call out, obviously, um, mental health is um, the first approach that we're using with this, but it is a methodology that we plan to use across other health service delivery as well. So that's a, that's a whirlwind tour of its application for us, Ian. Sorry, I just got to unmute myself as I'm coughing here in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Never a great thing in the middle of a COVID-19 crisis. You know, I think the treasurer found this last night to be coughing and spitting, but I'm on my own. In the face of the COVID-19 thing, when you see those figures about the size of the curve, 
you know, do you feel having invested in this beforehand that you can now have conversations with people in real time that are not just, you know, filled with anxiety and, and uh, uh, being overwhelmed? Do you, do you feel more empowered to make the decisions that you need to make with your partners on behalf of the community? Absolutely. I mean, forewarned is forearmed. And I think, um, you know, what this has allowed us to do is particularly challenge, um, you know, some of the traditional ways that we've always done things. Um, and, and, you know, particularly, you know, before COVID, but especially with COVID, um, really tailor our interventions based on some of that modelling that we've um, identified. And look, you know, there are always challenges in that and, you know, people will challenge the accuracy. But I mean, Joe went through the validation of the model earlier. Um, and, and I guess the thing that I always highlight to people when they're challenging um, how we're supporting our decision making with this is, well, what is it that we currently use if we're not using modelling? to help us understand this complexity <laughs> and the way that we commission. And, you know, the answer is often um, not a lot. Individual interventions have evidence, but we are not currently using anything that helps us understand the complexity of how we put all these things together in a system. Don't you know, and Julie, in Australia, we hate managed care. It's America. We hate it. We love chaos. My intervention's better than your intervention. There's no evidence to the other, and we should just add them all up. This is what I really hate. If we add them all up, my intervention, your intervention, we fund them all, you know, 130%, actually on the ground, 18% maybe. Or so, you know, like we've got this myth that if we funded everything and we just provided everything, there'd be all these marvelous outcomes, which is clearly in anyone who works in any dynamic system and anywhere in any other area knows to be untrue. So thank you for that marvellous presentation. I love the idea of being challenged, being challenged continuously. And I'm trying to respond as many as I can along the way. Some are technically out of my league about sensitivities and parameters, and I'm sending them back to others, some other estimates we put in. But I do think it's a very interesting thing when people say you haven't done, and we actually have, but the size of your effect isn't as big as you think it is, or it interacts with another effect. There's competing effects. And in many of those situations, there are gaps. We're not making, I think, Julie, before COVID-19, the discussion we were having, we haven't invested enough in the long-term effects. We tend to infect in short-term effects and hope that everything will be fixed by the next financial year. You're really committed to the longer-term social determinants in your region, which are very challenging, and that's great. In the context of the COVID-19, there is what we do now, but also what we do long-term. At this point, I want to hand over to Frankie Iofino, who's one of our postdocs, who's been working on the 21st century. Can we actually use technology? Don't you love these little things? Can we actually do stuff that would allow us to coordinated care, or dare I say it, Julie, from the PHN point of view, hold providers accountable for what they're doing and actually know what they are doing and perhaps what the clinic next door is doing. For those who know the brain and brain mind sort of slogan in healthcare, it's right care first time. And as I've just said this evening in another forum, actually, I don't care why you get better. I care if you don't get better or you get worse. And I want to know as quickly as possible so you get to better care. And I must say, with the focus on suicide that we've had in the last two weeks, that really matters. Frank, do you want to take us through what can be done with 21st century technology? Sure, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to provide a quick overview of the use of digital technologies in this model. Uh, and this work was carried out with local stakeholders who work across a number of settings, as well as people with lived experience, as Julie touched on earlier. Uh, and it was clear from these workshops that there are a range of problems associated with the way services are organised, which often impacts on the quality of care. So this includes mental health treatment isolated from physical and social needs, late intervention, long wait times, and often poor communication between services. And these issues were identified as particularly problematic for people with more complex needs. So those who might need housing support or are disengaged for employment, uh, which typically requires an effective care coordination and team-based care approach. Uh, next slide, please, Grace. And we know that the integrated use of technologies uh, may be one of the biggest enablers for effective uh, care coordination. So the accessibility, the scalability, and the standardization of digital technologies means that we are well placed to they are well placed to have a major role in mental health care. They are able to provide systematic assessment personalised treatment plans, outcome monitoring and decision support across a variety of settings and away from the clinic when people are in there at home. 
So their use in mental health systems has already demonstrated utility to improve access to care and communication between clinicians and consumers. But as uh, Ian and Julie touched on, you know, what is the impact of these types of, in of interventions within a broader system? And that's what we aim to model uh, here in this model. Uh, next slide, please, Grace. So under the business as usual scenario, this is based on pre-COVID assumptions, but the, 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 the trends here are the same under the post-COVID assumptions Joe touched on. Uh, th there are approximately 12,000 self-harm hospitalizations and 900 suicide deaths forecast for the period between 2021 and 2030. And we carried out sensitivity analysis to assess the impact of uncertainty in the model parameter estimates of, of this intervention on the simulation results. And these results indicated that for the total population, uh, the implementation of technology coordinated care was forecast to reduce self-harm hospitalizations but, uh, and suicide deaths by about 7%. And for comparison, increasing the service capacity growth of existing services by 20% had approximately a 2% reduction for the same period. Next slide, Grace. And we see that even these, these same patterns for mental health related ED presentations and the prevalence of high psychological distress. And so this emphasizes how using technologies to strengthen the way the whole mental health system functions together is really important. And when combined with the other interventions such as increased service capacity growth uh, and post attempt aftercare, as Joe Ann showed earlier, it can have a major impact on outcomes. Next slide, Grace. The effects of this intervention are guided by an evidence-based literature, which indicate that using technologies to deliver coordinate, uh, coordinated care improves the per-service probability of recovery, and it improves care pathways to secondary prevention and specialised services, which includes referrals to housing support or employment support programs for those who need it. And it also reduces disengagement by re-engaging those who have been lost to services due to increased wait times or due to an experience of inadequate care, which is so common. And so altogether, this functions to ensure that people receive the appropriate type of mental health care and reduces their wait for these services, which is so often a major cause of inefficiencies and ineffectiveness in complex mental health systems. Next slide, please. However, this work also suggests that the way these technologies are employed really matters and has an impact on the outcomes. So simply replacing existing services or consultations with video conferencing will have some impact, but won't quite cut it. So you can see here in, these, in, the, in this graph that new models of care are needed to leverage the benefits of using technologies I've mentioned. And when you don't use them in this way, um, then, then the outcomes aren't as great. And so, the way to leverage the benefits of technology are these better triage processes that are facilitated by online assessments and a skilled workforce, routine outcome monitoring, which may involve linking with other effective apps and e-tools or wearables, and importantly, interoperable systems that improve information flows and reduce duplication for better communications between providers and with their patients. Next slide, please. And as you increase the proportion of mental health services which use this type of technology, then the impact on these outcomes also increases. This illustrates the importance of ensuring proper uptake across the whole system to reach the full potential on patient outcomes and health service efficiencies. Next slide, Grace. And so this really does emphasize that overcoming the implementation barriers associated with the new, these new technologies is critical. Our, our recent work has identified key technology, clinician, service factors that currently limit the effectiveness of new technologies. These factors include variation in the level of integration into existing service pathways and clinical protocols, or staff attitudes and training, or the overall degree of local leadership and organizational support for these technologies, and importantly, the lack of interoperability between systems. Addressing these technology and implementation barriers at a local level are critical to ensure these technologies are developed and integrated with services in a way that truly transforms clinical practice for the whole system. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Frank.
digital technologies, so much part of our lives, but actually so much in healthcare is still not coordinated or uses the essential technology to link people, link outcomes and make transparent and make accountable our systems. I really hope that one of the things that comes out of this whole crisis is actually a fundamental shift to the use of technologies to empower users of services, but also those responsible like Julie for funding and commissioning services. As a service provider, actually you might have to know what you do, who you do it with. Does it really do what you think it does? Even if you've been trained to do it, maybe it doesn't do it as well as you thought. Now, I'd love to be an economist. In fact, for those of us who know my relationship with Alan Fells and the why, reason I joined the National Mental Health Commission in 2012, it was to do a short course in economics. And I consulted Alan only last week and some people said, where have the economic assumptions come that have gone into these models? We consult the economists widely, the Reserve Bank, others, but we're not economists. So we thought it was really important since the main disruptor here clearly, clearly, as far as mental health and wellbeing and suicide prevention is, is unemployment and underemployment and the complex relationships which people just said between job keeper are people really employed or unemployed and those who moved to job seeker etc etc that's a lot of these words i'm not sure where they come from but we used to call underemployment kenny is our resident economist people think kenny we're not interested in economics myself and fells only went on to the national commission in 2012 because we wanted to discuss the mental wealth of the country that this is a central productivity issue as an essential issue to the future economic social wealth of our country. Mental health is that. So Kenny, what do you make of these models? Thank you Ian and good evening everyone. What a pleasure it is to be here and um, what a pleasure it was to be, to be asked to collaborate um, on what is a, an outstanding model and just to big up my fantastic colleague and friend Adam Skinner again. Um, nothing would have been possible without him and, and Julie is just such an enlightened policy maker. Um, so what am I going to talk about here? Well, first of all, um, it's to recognise what Ian just said. Um, mental health is not just valued in itself, but is also a means to an end in terms of wider economic growth. But actually, it actually feeds back into mental health itself. It's so important to have system dynamic models in order to represent an evolving process. So as we know, this is an evolving situation, COVID-19, the economy, mental health, and policy responses itself. Dynamic simulation model captures these independencies. Now I'm going to show you two scenarios, both of which are aligned with consensus forecasts and updatable as the situation changes. So scenario one is where unemployment reaches 11.1%, youth unemployment 24%. Now this is slightly higher than the national average and the reason is is because North Coast starts from a more disadvantaged base. Scenario two is where we have a more worst case scenario. So unemployment is considerably higher, both on a population scale overall and for youth unemployment. Now the assumption within the model in terms of the recovery from the economy is U-shaped. So the, the idea being that, you know, we, we, have, we have a downturn uh, and conditional and governmental responses, and um, we slowly recover. However, as, as we are going through that process, there can be considerable mental health impacts and also economic impacts as well. So the next four slides is going to talk you through a few scenarios. Now we have a table, lots of figures. So as you cast your eyes down the details, I'm going to concentrate on the story. Um, and then hopefully we're going to meet at the bottom where I talk about the cumulative impacts. So those two scenarios to recap for scenarios where productivity losses um, result from scenario one, which is unemployment ticking to 11%. Scenario two, where unemployment ticks to uh, around 16%. So I'm going to talk you through scenario one to begin with. Um, now you'll notice here we have broken the results down by year over a five year period. And we've got two columns for each scenario. The first scenario is the combined productivity loss. Now this is from unemployment and also from those in employment suffering from mental distress. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the second column is a subset of the first. This is essentially productivity impacts from mental health directly from those employed. So the first thing to notice, uh, or the first thing for me to say rather, is what's the comparison? The comparison is with no COVID. So this is scenario one, COVID occurred, uh, unemployment's ticking up quite considerably. Here's the change in productivity losses due to mental distress 
relative to a no COVID scenario. So these are changes. So the people with uh, an eye for detail might notice a negative number for um, the March to January, uh, 2020, 2021. And the reason for this is because whilst there is productivity losses for those employed, and I'll, I'll talk about that in the next slides, we have essentially, you know, people are becoming unemployed, so we're shifting the impact to, to the unemployed themselves. Now, in terms of the story, there, there are lag effects. As the economy adjusts um, and, and essentially takes a hit, um, they're, they're, they're initially, you know, uh, companies tend to, to unfortunately, uh, retrench people who are young because they, they're often easier to get rid of, casual employment. Um, but then the, you know, the effects on employment um, actually kick in over the next year. The other lag effect to, to bear in mind is that mental distress, whilst the economy recovers, the impact on mental distress continues. So this is why we represent the scenario over that five year period. This is the consensus with regard to how the economy might recover. Um, and you know, we, we also see you know, the impacts on mental health actually in, increasing over time. Now, what's included in productivity impacts? Well, it's things like, first of all, employment, but also those who are employed with absenteeism. So you're taking days off, presenteeism. So, you know, you're trying to work, but you're not quite working at your best because you're under a heightened degree of distress. But also includes people who then go on to commit self-harm, unfortunately. So that's time in hospital. And um, it's those who tragically go on and commit suicides. Um, and it's also including the impact of carers. Often carers are the ones forgotten here, but you know, the, the impact on, on trying to manage and care for, for people suffering mental distress goes beyond statutory services. And we really need to think about how to support carers as well. So let's think about some of these numbers. So in terms of the cumulative impact over that five year period, under scenario one, remember the conservative scenario, it's over two billion for this region. So that's quite a considerable sum. The mental health impacts specifically for those in employment are about 11% of that. But that's crucial. So when we're thinking about government responses and our people are worried about productivity, we need to recognize the interaction between those who are still employed, suffering from mental distress, they're also not quite working at their best. And that's about 11%. Now, if we switch to scenario two, which is more of the worst case scenario, you know, on average, um, we, we see that there's a doubling of the impact. So in short, um, you know, we're going through tough times. Uh, this is going to continue. There's a lag effect for mental health, which we must be aware of in terms of the impact on productivity. And cumulatively for this region, this is huge. Just think about what's happening nationally and in different regions as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thanks. So this slide itself is look, representing the absolute losses in productivity. So the slide before was about the change in productivity relative to the a no COVID scenario. Now this slide is about we're in the COVID-1 scenario. So because we're naturally conservative with their forecast that we're providing, we're choosing scenario one, we're in this scenario now. So what we'll see is we're comparing COVID um, with the same policy responses. So no changes, it's business as usual, we're trying to, to, to manage people with heightened level of distress and here's the impact on productivity. So that's, that's the green. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compare the impact with turning on these interventions. So um, as Frank eloquently outlined, we've got technology enabled care and we've got also post attempt care. So these are people who have tried to commit suicide. Thankfully that didn't go through, but these people need wraparound services in tents. We're going to switch that on as well but we're also increasing capacity. So the key thing for the economics here and policy responses is that we need balance between our interventions. Going back to Ian's point, it's no good thinking about single interventions and applying evidence which uh, existed years ago and thinking they apply now. The idea is we need to balance. Um, and Australia's done a pretty good job in terms of responding to COVID. Other countries haven't. And one of the key issues for that is finding the lack of balance. So Julie talked about portfolios. Now here's a portfolio of interventions to try and reduce the productivity impact. A question online was about uncertainty, and this is why we have these plan charts. We've run the model multiple times, we've changed parameter inputs, which, you know, we've really stress tested this, and here are the results. We've got a very clear and consistent story. If it's just business as usual, if we don't invest in new interventions, here are the green fans at the top, 
productivity losses are enormous. If we invest in this portfolio of interventions, which is just one set, Julie talked about social determinants as well, which is key, but just this one set of three interventions, we see a reduction in productivity, which is close to 100 million for this region. And that's about 40% of the productivity costs themselves. So this is modifiable. We don't have to simply accept that mental health impacts will come. We can invest in interventions that work and we can get wider productivity impacts for society as a whole. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it's not just about productivity. Um, let's think about the health sector also. So this dynamic sim model is bringing together the health sector, the economy, policy responses. And we're simulating these in a dynamic frame. Now this is the dashboard that, that Julie and her policy colleagues see before them. Essentially, it's their policy sat nav. It's trying to tell them, you know, what would happen if we switch on certain interventions relative to others? What would happen if we've got portfolios? Now what we've got here on the left-hand side is the interventions, both, uh, and also below that, service capacity growth. So we're thinking about balance. We're not just investing in single interventions, but multiple, but we're also aware that we need the supply capacity as well. Otherwise, we could have unintended consequences. Now, what I just want to focus on here is the, the impact of switching on assertive aftercare. So to remind, this is people who have committed um, self-harm, and we really want to support them for that not to happen. And um, so the first line in terms of the annual increment of expenditures, <clears throat> excuse me, break into who pays. So the Commonwealth, the states and out of pocket. Now, this is the background health expenditure within the regions for mental health. The line below is the cost of introducing a set of aftercare. So we've costed this out for the region. <clears throat> and that's approximately 5.3 million over a five year period. And then what we want to do is think about what's the downstream cost as well in terms of other services. So I've got balance in the system. We want to increase the demand to support people, but there's also downstream consequences as well on psychiatrists, psychologists, allied health and others. And the combined health sector investment would be approximately 31 million over five years. Now, what might the impacts be? Here's where I'm going to take you to the bottom row. Now, this quality thing, what does this mean? Well, if we um, uh, invest in assertive aftercare, we're extending life and also improving the quality of it as well by reducing the stress. And um, so, you know, we've got 900 quality adjusted life years over a five year period. This is important. In terms of thinking about the cost per suicide avoided, in terms of people's lives, this is minimum. And when we think about the cost per quality gain, so health economists sometimes talk about cost effectiveness. If something, in terms of a rule of thumb, something is below $50,000 per quality adjusted life year gained, I'm sorry about all the jargon, but what this means is that this is very cost effective to be investing in. Now, if we actually value the health as well, and this is all about people's lived experience. So the economic series is just about layering on and, and, and trying to provide a foundational argument, but it's about people's health and well-being. The societal value created for this region by switching on post-attempt care is approximately 14 million over five years. And just as a final point on this slide, the model run here is for five years, but it can run for any time period. It can run over lifetimes, it can run over annual, it can be smaller increments. It's all aligned to Julie's needs in terms of what is the decision? When is it going to be taken? How much do I have? And it's as flexible as that. Next slide, please. So the take home messages here is that we really do need dynamic simulation modeling. It's akin to a sat nav in my view. We can't use static modeling approaches. We can't use single studies. These are, these are analog methods in a digital age. We have dynamic simulation models fit for purpose, developed through a participatory process led by Julie, and we've got a team around her trying to help her drive the policy agenda forward. It's an evolving situation, and the model can be updated accordingly. We need to ensure that we've got rapid decision support. So policy options, costs and consequences, we're not telling anyone what to do, we're giving menus and the costs and consequences from that. Let's make sure that what we're exist, investing in at the moment is effective and efficient. But as we pour more resources into the system, there's an opportunity for policy coordination. 
Decisions taken in one sector affect the others. Decisions taken by the Feds in terms of the, the economy, fiscal, monetary, and also lockdown policies will have impacts on mental health. The mental health response in terms of the health sector, social determinants, in turn feedback into the economy. Only it's a just system like models. Can Kenny, we're running out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. So, 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 so the final theme here is invest in mental health, alleviate distress, save lives, which is what we're fundamentally interested in. And by doing that, we create wealth itself. Thank you. For Kenny, do you, want to do, do you want to run our public relations campaign for us, Kenny? Just take <laughs> that and just do it. You know, you can just tell someone in the bubble, that's the answer. From an economist. It's all about the economy now. That analog in a digital age, I hate to tell you, Kenny, um, paper and pencil in the digital age a hospital i was doing recently analog would be an advance on the particular kind of end. you know so many of our health systems are 1852 telephone 1876 alexander graham bill got the patent just entered our medicare system we've got a little way to go but i mean it is a problem for us and i must say what you said about the models the models are right up to date just what is happening elsewhere used in other industries now finally before we run out of time matthew hamilton from origin all this talk about the economy, but do young people get distressed and develop disorders? Matthew's been working with Origin, with Pat McGorry, and very much the extent to which actually people do develop mental ill health and doing that by place and circumstance. Matthew. I assume when Matthew unmutes himself. Matthew? By being unmuted. There we go, Matthew. Your marvelous right. soft tones from the other part of the world. Fantastic. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, and great. So, listen. Uh, uh, over the the last few pre presenters, I think it's given a pretty good case as to why you might want to do this sort of modelling to look at both social determinants and the health system redesign. And what I'm going to talk about is some of the things that might help us develop the capacity in Australia to do this sort of work. I start off with the fact we've actually got fairly good modeling capacity across a range of things within Australia, a lot of it in different types of techniques, but these are the things that will actually feed into doing these more dynamic simulation um, uh, endeavors. And I think we should build on that. Um, and part of it is also about collaborating uh, between the different modeling projects. Now, there's a number of reasons to collaborate, but basically because this is a very complex undertaking and no one group can actually do this on our own. We actually are going to be reliant on other people doing different parts of the puzzle. And the other thing is the more complicated the model, the easier it is to make mistakes. And by actually having multiple models addressing the same sort of issues, it's more likely you'll find those mistakes before you put your models out of the public domain. Part of it also relates to improving the transparency models because policymakers have got to trust what they are using as decision aids. And the more transparency on these more complicated models, the more likely they are to have some trust in the outputs. And the last thing, which again is, I think, has been highlighted by a number of previous speakers, is around um, that models shouldn't be developed for one particular point in time and then left on the shelf because the environment changes. And uh, what the funders and those that are undertaking models should iteratively refine them and have the frameworks to do that. And this relates to the last thing of that policymakers often are faced with very pressing uh, immediate terms challenges to make a decision in the here and now. But there also is a big picture here about uh, over time developing a much more sophisticated understanding of the complex systems in which mental disorder arises and is treated. Uh, so next slide, please, Grace. Um, so to rephrase all that, uh, basically it's a big complicated problem and you ideally want to break such a problem into smaller, more manageable tasks, get as much skilled help as you can to undertake it, have some sort of plan or framework to knit it all together into a coherent message and be realistic around what's needed to do that. And I think the best way I, I can think of it to communicate it is models are like Lego bricks in terms of we're all doing different bits. Some people are working in primary care, specialist care, prevention. And ideally, we should be able to stick those together, but not just models as a whole. Models are big, major undertakings, both the data and the algorithms that go into them take a lot of work for the individual components. And each of those uh, components should be available as Lego bricks as well. So if people don't like some of your models, they can take the bits that's usable to them and useful. Um, next slide, please. 
So uh, in terms of our attempt to do this, uh, over the last three years, um, we've been developing an open science framework for the development of simulation models in mental health. The motivation for that is that we were funded at that time by VicHealth to develop a model of resilience for Victoria. And as we approached planning that, it was clear that this is actually a major and complicated undertaking. And to do it just for Victoria would seem to be um, a potential uh, waste of a significant amount of effort. So though our model was going to focus on Victoria, we wanted to design it in a way that it would be relatively straightforward for others or ourselves to generalize it to other contexts. And the other thing is that we want to be able to extend into other areas of prevention and also other areas of mental health care service delivery to get a much more whole of system um, uh, view. Um, so we decided to develop a framework and a set of tools to implement that. We've applied those tools to other simulation model work that we have in Origin at the Moment in Epidemiology, E-Mental Health Help Seeking and Primary Mental Health Care. All of these we plan to be publishing this year and we'll be releasing all the code and data in open source format so other people can see what we've done, uh, see if they agree with it, play around with it, change it and use anything they find useful in their own work. And the other thing we'll be releasing is a, a toolkit that we've developed to implement our models uh, in the hope that some people, other people might find them useful to implement a similar sort of framework. Um, so next slide, please. So why, why have we put all this effort in developing a framework? Well, I mean, I've alluded to some of this in the introduction. Basically, policymakers need to trust the models, and the models themselves need to be value for money. And the more complicated they are, it's, it's a lot more work to validate and communicate. And the more cross-validation you have between models and the more transparency you have, the easier it is going to be to build trust. The other thing is that these sort of modeling projects are require a sort of different toolkit and a different approach to some more of the traditional modeling approaches, which are feasible to do within a, in a, in a, within a one research group. It might take a couple of years, but it's still doable. But this is actually a major undertaking that require a lot more collaboration between uh, different types of groups. And some of the challenges to actually getting that collaboration are quite significant, particularly in how you implement the models because it's harder for models to talk to each other if they're talking different languages. Next slide, please. Um, so in practice, what we've done is we start with relatively simple models, but we implement them in a manner that each component part of those in terms of the algorithms, the data uh, are readily reusable by others. Um, we also have a set of tools to streamline the process of generalizing the relatively simple models we developed for a particular context to other contexts. And once we've validated these more simple representations, then we move to refining them and extending them. And then basically linking the different types of models together, including those from other groups. And um, go to the next slide, please. Um, and um, so basically in terms of a work example over the last uh, year or so, so we firstly developed a relatively simple demographic model predicting population counts. We then wrote some code to generalize that to any context in Australia. So for somewhere like Victoria, uh, we'd run maybe 7,000 parallel models, each with their own unique data set that is uh, specific to the spatial unit being modeled and producing uh, outputs for that particular area. We then use that demographic model as the basis for an epidemiological model. Um, and uh, we're using you know, literature as prevalence rates. And then we took some of the outputs from uh, the model that you just heard about of the, the recent speakers uh, by Joanne uh, as input into our model. They've they modeled a lot of things that we didn't have the bandwidth to do, but we would think, well, maybe we can generalize parts of that to get a message that's represented for other areas beyond the North Coast. And within our own modeling projects, we are basically uh, looking at using that, those kind of relatively simple models to, to scale the agent populations we're developing um, for our more complicated models. These are ones where go for individual, uh, representing individual households and individual uh, people uh, to get a, a sense of the equity of uh, outcomes across the population. Next slide, please. Um, I, I suppose to tie it up um, in terms of you know, obviously um, we're able to get a, a relatively uh, good profile of the expected distribution of outcomes in an area of interest. And if you go to the last slide, please, I think the take home uh, messages that I would like to, to leave with is that obviously we've got good capacity within Australia, 
But if we're to move beyond doing individual modeling and to do more complex system modeling of the type that Joanna and her team have uh, highlighted so excellently, um, we need to put a number of things in place. And the things I would recommend as priorities is open source code and data, standardizing workflows and the descriptions of the data that are being used in the models, a set of common frameworks and software to make it easier for people to, to use those common workflows and to adopt a common framework. And finally, for funders to invest in building modeling capacity and also having longer timeframes for modeling projects so it can build in the continuous improvement because models get better with better data and, better, and more time. So that would be the, my last take home recommendation. Ian, learn to use the technology. On that last question, Matthew, and we have gone over time and I apologize to everyone else and if they have to drop out, they will, but since people are still online and there are lots of questions to answer, I'll just try and sum up and, and bring some of those together. So on this open source and transparency, just to say Joanne and her colleagues through CSAT and others have a letter in science on COVID and open and transparent data, we are committed to that. The models are actually owned and operated by those who commission them, Julie and others. They're not owned by us. We provide the particular issues to them so that they can work them in their areas. People want to know in the various regions we worked, uh, Northern Rivers of New South Wales, Western Sydney, urban, obviously urban area, Hunter, New England, far west, the four big models we've worked on in the particular issues. That's not the whole of Australia. No, it's not the whole of Australia. There are about 50 functional regions in Australia. For those who remember Simon Crean's office, he used to have the regional map of Australia, much better than the maps of the states and territories. Ideally, prior to COVID-19, we would have had such maps for all the areas, particularly now the 31 PHNs across Australia, and we would have a more detailed composite model, which would be the national model. Unfortunately, COVID-19 didn't wait until we actually had done all that, or we probably wouldn't have done it anyway. This has been a long and complicated process. Each model on the ground takes a long time for the co-design, the buy-in. I've had a lot of backwards and forwards with some people this evening about the co-design. Is there lived experience? Is there general engagement with local organisations? Do we really care about subpopulations? Are all the relevant services engaged? These are complex questions and wants to be answered in each community. What Julie's really done and others are doing in the Hunter New England, in Western Sydney, is building those partnerships, building those communities, working with people like Matthew and Joanne and her teams to be informed, bringing in the expertise of people like Kenny with genuine economics backgrounds to what this means, what is the productivity gains, where are the longer term sets of issues. So we certainly do not have all the answers to all the questions and in Australia we don't. But guess what? We do have COVID-19. And guess what? The people with the virus who are modeling the virus had no Australian data. They thought it might be the flu. Guess what? It's not the flu. The virus doesn't behave that way. And what they've done is modify the data continuously and quickly in relation to real-time data. So my final point is about real-time data. A lot of time and effort in my view is being wasted continuously talking, for example, about completed suicide, which is like completed at attribution of deaths due to COVID-19, which will happen for the next 55 years in theses about the COVID-19 crisis when it's all over. I've just seen recent analysis of the suicide data from the 2009, published in The Lancet this week, crisis and its effect across 63 countries. We don't have the luxury of having all the answers or perfect systems. What we have are very good models. We have some great examples in Australia of Australian data in different regions due to the work, I must say, of people in PHNs like Julie, like in Hunter in New England, like in Western Sydney and like in far Western New South Wales. And the work of Matthew and his colleagues in Victoria, supported by the Victorian government to get down to that community level. Place matters, populations matters. There isn't some one sensible national solution. Australia is a very complicated place. We need to get it right in the regions in which people live for the people who live in those regions. What economic crises do, however, is kill the vulnerable. It's those who are at the margins. It is unemployment, it is social disconnection, it is those who are already in trouble, and those areas where the whole industries have been wiped out in tourism, hospitality, retail, the effects on the higher education sector, the effects on the arts and creative sectors, which are not simply coming back in a snapback. There's been questions about how long we've modeled I think what we've shown here are myself very conservative models. And the best I can tell with consultation with those who work for the Reserve Bank, those who work from the Treasury estimates, those who work in economics internationally, we have modeled the most conservative, which is one year of disruption at the current rates with slow recovery as described by the Treasurer just recently. 
That is the most optimistic forecast. Of course, in economics, as in health, we don't know the future. We will see what actually happens over time. But I'd suggest the responsibility of us all is in fact to try and make the best decisions that we can make preemptively. I think we've all seen the value of that with the government decisions, acting on medical advice with regards to the shutdown to protect us from the horrendous impacts of the COVID virus as experienced in health consequences elsewhere in the world, saving many lives, including, I must say, many older lives like my own. There are many younger lives on the line in the COVID-19 situation and their preoccupation, as some said, with the youth sector, that's right. That's where a lot of lives will be lost. That's where a lot of marginality, where a lot of long-term effects. And Kenny touched on productivity. I think another question I've answered along the way or attempted to answer, one of the things we know from the 2009 global financial crisis is that governments made it worse, particularly for young people in Europe when they followed the crisis with austerity, when they actually followed the crisis with actually not supporting employment, education, ongoing healthcare for those most affected, those at the margins. So these things do not play out equally across society. They're not like wars. We don't intrinsically come together. These crises are socially divisive. They're not necessarily socially cohesive. I, like many of us, hope that Australia actually does behave in a socially cohesive way. But more importantly, in each of the regions and communities in which we live, that we behave in a socially cohesive way, that we do take care, but that we also invest. And I do care that we invest in things that work. It's very easy to champion the favorite thing you do, the service you provide, the perspective you have, but there's another level of this. If we are genuinely collective, which is respect the different perspectives and look at the evidence and the data in real time and be informed by that. I hope this evening has provided you with insights into the way we're trying to address that problem that people we're collaborating with, the insights we're trying to work with, and the way that we are trying to empower communities to make these particular issues. The really good news, I think, hopefully, is that this issue is now firmly on the table. Greg Hunt has made it clear that this type of information will inform the National Cabinet's response now and into the future. These estimates, the models, will change in relation to real-time data. But real-time data needs to act locally and be effective. There's a set of useful resources here. The references that are extensive that Joanne and her teams can provide the uh, already extensively peer-reviewed publications on the models are there for the more academics. For those who want to use them in real time, please be in contact with us about how this takes. It is not a short-term process to establish one of these models. But due to the work that Matthew is doing, the work that Joanne is doing, the work that others are doing, we are trying to find the most effective uh, backgrounds or templates to bring to communities. I thank everyone for their participation, but I must particularly thank Joanne and her team, Matthew and his team for the statistical work for these particular areas. Our work is supported by an NHMRC, that's right, NHMRC peer reviewed, Centre for Research Excellence. It only took us three years to convince the NHMRC to invest in modelling. They said, what modelling? Why don't you just run another trial? I said, because it's a complex system actually to actually understand what is going on, to develop real world interventions. And so the partner organisations in the Brain and Mind Centre, Youthe, which is the CRE, and Origin Youth Health are the key supporters. But on the ground, it's people like Julie and the PHNs who are the heart and soul of this work. And I must thank them greatly. If you want to work with Julie, you should work with her. Thank you, everyone else, for your time and your attention, and we'll make the webinar and its references available to you. And I thank you to our other co-presenters. Good night. <laughs>